Hello and welcome to State of the Economy. Uh, it's been two years since uh, the Modi government uh, uh, came to power. A uh, lot of hopes of a robust economic recovery uh, were there. Uh, some of it is uh, not fully realized though. Uh, the economy is uh, slowly uh, showing signs of recovery, uh, gradually uh, recovering, but uh, the kind of recovery that was uh, anticipated uh, uh, in the in the first year of uh, this government and the kind of uh, reforms and the public investment push that they came up with uh, seems to have uh, uh, given some fillip to growth but not as much as expected uh, largely because private investment is still to pick up a private investment is uh, somewhat stagnant uh, and to discuss uh, this and uh, and other issues uh, relating to the economy we we have with us uh, Mr. Harshwardhan Niyotia, President of FIKI, which is one of the oldest, uh, probably the oldest uh, uh, association of industries and uh, he should have a sense uh, from the ground as to what exactly is going on about private investment. Welcome to our show, uh, Mr. Harshwardhan Niyotia. So, so what is your sense? Uh, all analysts, uh, I have read IMF's uh, uh, prognosis just two days ago where they say that that things are looking better, but private investment for some reason is not picking up. Uh, some economists say that industry is still working at about 75 percent capacity, so it still has to sort of capacity utilization is uh, still to uh, to move up. Uh, what's your sense? Well, so you have given a cue to the answer. It is true that uh, the capacities were built on the expectation of 8-9 percent growth uh, four or five years ago and that didn't happen. So naturally there is excess capacity. As a result, you have borrowed money, you have invested and you are not able to fully utilize it. The second thing is that we must remember that the world has been under severe stress. Yeah. The economy has been choppy world over and there are lots of issues. So that also has had its impact. We have Th actually underestimated the headwinds coming from the rest of the world generally, right? Yes. Uh, so that is a very, I mean, and today in a global economy, India though somewhat insulated is not fully insulated. Yeah. So the global impacts do impact us. The third, we know that we've had two bad monsoons yeah. and therefore that has had its own uh, cascading effect on the And economy. rural India's purchasing power uh, has gone down because Obviously. of that. Obviously. The fourth, uh, as we all know and we've been talking about repeatedly in the media is that the interest rates have been high. And these have also been a dampener as far as capital investments are concerned. Okay. And the fifth, of course, we know is that there is a stress on the balance sheets of companies because of the NPA overhang. Sure. So, if you put this all together, uh, you will be able to kind of know that we have not been able to pick up private investment to that level mm -hmm. as probably the country wants or desires. So, so tell me, where do we go from here? There is one view that even if interest rates uh, were to be dropped by say 100 to 150 basis points, the question being raised by a uh, lot of economists is uh, how will banks lend because uh, there is consensus that bad loans in the or problematic uh, loans in the banks uh, books, public sector banks books is about 15 percent of their outstanding uh, credit which works out to roughly about 10 lakh crore. Now, if these are the problem assets and if these are not kind of in circulation, the banks are not getting it back. So even if interest rates are brought down by uh, assuming by 150 basis points, do you think banks will be able to increase the lending or is, are there other problems? Is capitalization is a bigger, is a real problem? So it's a combination. So there's obviously we, we have inadequate capital to fuel the next round of growth mm -hmm. and therefore bank capitalization and therefore mergers of some smaller banks with bigger banks, etc. A lot of things that are being talked about. Uh, when we look at the NPA issue, I mean, Fiki has submitted a paper to the government which basically outlines that NPAs have to be classified into three different baskets. There is one which is willful defaulters or people who have been fraudulent in their activities, etc. And our view is that the law should take its own course, the government should be firm, and there should be a process of recovery that should be set in place, whatever process that has to be. Sure. The other is that there are global cyclical factors and we are uh, also uh, not immune from them. 
and if supposing there is a sector or an industry uh, body uh, group which has been affected by global factors then they probably need some more time and they need some support like to, steel for instance yeah global so, commodities have crashed yeah. so yeah so 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 the, they are the th and third is where there are regulatory issues which have held up a project for instance a last mile land acquisition has held up an infrastructure project mm. or not getting an environment clearance or something those like issues that. have been resolved isn't it by this government well but there is a consequent npa issue that has come so one is that you resolve the say the land acquisition problem but because of that you have lost two years or three years or whatever and as a result so you're saying that all these should be put in different buckets these problems yeah. because they are very it's like different ailments that we may have contracted which have different causes causes yeah. so there are some which need to be dealt in one manner and some that and i think generally i see the government fairly mindful of this uh, i don't think their intent is to uh, to curb entrepreneurship in fact they have been encouraging entrepreneurship mm -hmm. so they want risk taking appetite to be there at the same time they do not want someone uh, to take advantage of the situation mm -hmm. and sort of gold trip or gold plate their uh, uh, investments and uh, siphon off money from the system which is just as well because that's public money so i think once we take a holistic combined view of this uh, we can resolve to some extent the problem but yes is there a bad debt in the system there is is it large yes it is large what is the way forward well bank capitalization is one way forward and the other is a quick mechanism to redress and get whatever recoveries are possible do you see that happening well i do see a lot of action i have a lot more than it was before i don't think a lot of resolutions have happened maybe it's work in progress and i am certainly optimistic that it will find there is one view uh, mr nutia which actually this flows from uh, an interview i had done of your predecessors uh, mr siddharth birla who when he took over that was i think the first budget of uh, this government i think uh, if memory serves me right so at that time he had also given uh, a similar proposal to the government uh, where where he argued that uh, that this piecemeal capitalization of banks uh, which the bu the budgets have proposed you know 10000 crore or 25000 crore uh, like that uh, 75000 crore over a period of 4 years it's not going to work because the the scale of the problem the magnitude of the problem is uh, such that you need a bigger surgery and he he was suggesting that banks probably need about 2 and 1/2 3 lakh crores uh, uh, to be infused uh, uh, at once i mean at once as in within say 2 years or so um, uh, in some ways that problem is now uh, the government has realized that problem that's why there is also talk that the rbi uh, has contingency reserves in its balance sheet huge reserves that rbi has earnings over the years you know, through interest earnings so my so so there is a uh, there's a proposal from the uh, coming from the finance ministry that th that some rbi can some 3 lakh 3 and a half lakh crores of rbi's uh, uh, reserves could no, be I, I, I infused have... into banks so would you agree with that see it's not for me to take a view on what rbi should do with its money and how the government would like to look at it there are two things one is that there is a case for banks to be recapitalized but, but do you agree that you need a you need a bigger dose of recapitalization than well i do think they need more money but capitalizing them through government is not the only way mm. they can be allowed to access money from the markets okay so the government needs to allow some dilution of shareholders so that they'll have to dilute government will have to dilute the stake below 51% right maybe but they can keep control by having a golden share option Yeah. so th uh, the question is that th we have to also understand that as a country we have limitation in terms of financial yeah. uh, leverage that we have so uh, and there are so many priorities where the investments of governments have to go now bank is certainly an important part of this entire economic space but it's not the only priority and therefore there would be areas where the money from the government has to be spent directly on certain projects and some places the government could permit Mm -hmm. banks and other public sector and other undertakings to actually go and raise resources from the market market yeah okay so uh, so you're saying that uh, uh, 
these solutions have to be sort of then attempted at various levels. Uh, Naturally, yeah, so see in a complex uh, situation, we will always have to have a nuanced approach and look at the various options available to us and take a balanced view on that. Tell me now, moving to uh, the economy per se, uh, how do you assess the uh, some of the recent developments uh, in the West, for instance, Brexit? A general uh, apprehension that capital flows may may not be as uh, normal as they used to be. Uh, so there is a psychology which is developing among, say, European banks and you know global banks to preserve capital. You know, so I keep hearing this from. Uh, the big financial institutions. You know. So, so, uh, so, do you think there could be uh, uh, deceleration of capital flows? Generally, it's been seen that capital flows have decelerated in the last four or five years. It's a global phenomenon. Post two thousand nine, it's not the, at the same level as it used to be earlier. So, so, what's your assessment uh, of capital flows? See, India appears to me to be a relatively brighter spot in the world. Yes, and people agree, yeah. And therefore, inward flow of remittances and inward flow of investments to me does not seem to be a significant challenge. In fact, I do very optimistically believe that in the next one or two years, we will see significant uh, foreign direct investment and foreign investment into India. Having said that, on a geopolitical scale, there is definitely going to be some changes that will happen in the world because we are seeing many phenomena. Brexit is just one of them. Yeah. The phenomena of instead of globalization, people are yeah, yeah, some kind of insular sense. Yeah. The trade blocks are getting renegotiated. There are many, many uh, what should I say, shifting pieces yeah. that are happening. Fact, our government has also taken a position that that we can't be going going headlong into things like RCEP, uh, you know, the re, the regional ex economic uh, cooperation with China and ASEAN countries. The way we did earlier, uh, you, you could have Chinese goods, you know, flooding your market through a, you know, through a trade arrangement. So, so there is a certain apprehension of that kind of, even in India, right? So, where, where does Fiki stand on that? Well, we are generally in favor of a of an open architecture. We are generally in favor of. Uh, you know the FTA regime. However, we we do feel that we need to negotiate looking at Indian concerns. Like all Indian, countries do. Yeah. Like all countries do. We feel that at times we have, perhaps without taking enough stakeholder inputs, mm -hmm. have perhaps disadvantaged some sectors of our economy. Mm -hmm. Having said that, in general, we were we were supporting of a. You would say that globalization have benefited. Uh, in general, in general, trade agreements have benefited yeah. India. In general, it has been it opens up the markets, and we want to integrate with the world markets. India has to, uh, as much as you protect your borders, you will also have challenges in exporting your goods, mm. and we still need to do a lot of export uh, from our country. So this is the general sense. But having said that, it's a very complex thing to be. Uh, probably discussed in in a short period of time, and there would be a lot of nuances and a lot of issues in each negotiation. So you have to study sector by sector, sector by sector, country by country, trade block by trade block. So, uh, you know, thankfully, I don't have to do that job, which is just as well because it it obviously requires a much bigger, greater understanding, which I don't personally. But you have, have you must be having teams in Fiki, which must be interacting with the government on. Some of well, we do, we yeah. do. I'm Sectoral teams, etc. Yeah, right? there's so, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's a very complex process yeah. that requires a lot of detailed deliberations and I might be aware of some issues but not certainly comprehensively the entire gamut. And tell me, what do you make of the recent uh, spate of FDI liberalization, you know, 100 percent in defense, uh, even in modern tech, uh, across the board, uh, across technologies. Uh, 100 percent in uh, brownfield pharma. Uh, there's been some criticism that India, uh, India should not open up uh, so much uh, and so soon. Uh, it's, uh, it's brownfield companies have done very well globally. We have 30 percent of the U.S. market are generics. Similarly, on defense, there is there is a view that many Indian companies are in the process of building a partnership, private sector companies uh, with uh, with other global companies. So they will now just simply come and buy you out. Do you share those apprehensions? Well, Fiki has been supportive of an FDI, uh, liberal FDI regime. We uh, feel that it's moving in the direction in which we 
set ourselves the goal in 1991 once we started opening up the economy uh, last 25 years we've been moving in that direction so it's only logical that we've taken some more steps in that uh, in that so this is just the yeah it's further deepening of our yeah and it's our it's our long of our glo economic globalization process yeah, yeah it's the path we have set for ourselves and i think we generally feel that it would be beneficial for the country in a long term perspective tell me uh, and this this also ties in with our make in india f project right if you if you say make in india you have to be open you have to allow people to come and make in india that's the whole idea right now one of the issues that 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 was hindering uh, uh, structural issues that hindering make in india was this whole GST uh, uh, framework. Now, uh, GST has huge potential. Everybody agrees. It can create a common market in India. It will reduce indirect ta you know, taxation by a good 6-7 percentage points, which could be a huge fiscal stimulus, bring down inflation. So, uh, political consensus now in parliament uh, building around it. We may soon have a constitutional amendment. So, uh, how do you view th the GST going forward? Well, it's transformative. I think it's the single most important tax legislation that we could bring about in our country. It will, uh, as you very rightly said, unify the markets. Most importantly, bring a lot of transparency into the system yeah. and see that leakages and uh, non-compliance, etc. is severely discouraged. So looking at all the benefits that stand out of it, I, I think it's something that is long overdue and should happen. Uh, of course, any new implementation of this nature will lead to some disruptions yeah. and uh, there will be some teething troubles. But the uh, fact that we have debated this for a couple of years uh, intensely, I think there is a mental preparation on part of industry and the government and the IT platforms have sort of been sort of readied mm -hmm. to be able to take this in with hopefully minimal uh, you know disruptions. disruptions but some of them will happen but we have to face that one uh, once we change in fact the point you're making has has been uh, kind of referred to by uh, dr arvind subramanian the chief economic advisor of in the finance ministry and uh, hasmukh adia the revenue secretary they they penned an article together in a newspaper called the hindu where they say that that we cannot wait for a perfect gst to materialize so sure. we should go with whatever we have uh, within quotes even if an imperfect GST and then refine it going forward. Sure. So, but there is one view that any, a flawed GST uh, uh, can cause a lot of disruptions in the in the medium term before you refine uh, them. So, so it's like you know you have petroleum sector out, you have liquor sector out, you have electricity sector out and these are huge uh, you know sectors. So, uh, the politician wants to retain liquor at the state level because liquor funds elections you know also generates a lot of cash economy so do you think these are uh, these need to be addressed at a later stage they i think would be you know the thing is that we are first now uh, the issue is whether we are going to have a gst or not so i think we have pretty much crossed that hurdle yeah. i suppose once we start seeing the benefit of how the gst pans out the fact that is leading to higher growth the fact that it's leading to better compliance I think there will be a buy-in towards uh, the other items getting included. It may not all happen one together, it may happen sequentially. Let me say that we are not looking at a flawed GST, we are only looking at a GST which is not fully complete. Yeah. Uh, I don't think well, the… Flawed is the wrong word. Yeah. Uh, you begin with a… With a with maybe a, in a not fully perfect GST, then let's you… Put it, yeah. yeah. Oh. So, I think uh, which is just as well. I mean. Uh, Look at it another way. We are a democracy, and we have various va varying viewpoints and various uh, real issues on the ground. Uh, we may not be able to, with one stroke or one brush, sort out all the problems. But if we get towards that goal, even if it is over a period of a couple of years, I think uh, that's fine. After all, even our, our if you take 25 years of economic liberalization, we are still liberalizing. 25 years later and we have not done it with one stroke. I mean, it might have been a very decisive moment where many important decisions were taken, but the decisions that we see today have been taken almost every year in the last 25 years. And, and two, three governments have carried them forward. Sure. Four governments actually. Right. But tell me, the, the, uh, at a broader level, the industry's experience with the attitude of tax administration has been very bad. 
Now, this is there is consensus on this, whether it is UPA, India, whichever government. Because the tax department is a has a life of its own. <laughs> they say it is an independent republic, you know. So, so when you have a thing like GST, uh, there is some apprehension among businesses, uh, which I have read in the papers that now you, you may have to, the, the, the Indian GST will be administered uh, both by the center and the states. And both will be involved in the in the monitoring, uh, probably uh, in, in uh, tracking value added tax. Uh, this is keeping uh, the spirit of federalism uh, largely, you know, uh, in that spirit, both will be involved. So, businesses feel that you may start having to answer to two sets of uh, officials on the same transaction. If you are running a service company, if you operate through several states or a manufacturing. So, so is it a, is that a, is that apprehension justified? The attitude of the taxman. Oh. See, that is a million dollar question and we will have to wait for the time. Uh, my sense is that it will find its own level. I think there may be some concerns, there could be genuinely some overlap and all of this will get sorted out. I have not seen the fine print of the drafts that has been This circulated. of course comes later, at a later yeah. stage. Yeah. But on the implementation side, there will be issues. I am sure uh, issues will come up because you know at the time when you are passing a constitutional amendment, you do not look at the rules. You look at the idea. Now, we, after that, we will have a law and then the rules. Then the rules. from th that GST law. So, I think some of these issues will get tackled in the rules and some may still be left out, which by experience they will come. I do not think we should needlessly worry beyond a point, but yes, any new change leads to some dislocation. I think each one of us in our businesses will have to adjust to a new taxation uh, regime. And therefore, there will be some adjustment as a consequence that will be necessary. In what way do you think this will affect? Uh, one of the aims of GST also is to bring all businesses, uh, necessarily force them in, uh, into the value chain, so that cash economy also gets, you know, uh, addressed, attacked. So, say real estate, for instance, it's a uh, people feel that it's a, one of the biggest cash generating. Income. So, how will real estate be impacted by GST? Oh. See, the impact of GST is that it disincentivizes you mm -hmm. to evade the tax because you have you won't get the credit for taxes mm -hmm. that you have already paid. Mm -hmm. So the question is that the incentive to be outside the legitimate will, economy will, be, will, will the be cost will be very high. Will be high, and the and the and the incentive will not probably be sufficient mm. to do that. So therefore, the automatic compliance is being is happening. Because uh, the system is such that if you are not compliant, uh, you have difficulties. Uh, so I think it's a very positive way of looking at how to fix compliance. And another thing I want to ask you: the government has put out the GST draft law uh, for public comments just last week. Some experts have studied it, and they've told me uh, that uh, it has been prepared by taxmen, uh, and it largely uh, reflects their psychology, which is to preserve their turf, you know, so, so a lot of definitional issues, uh, they have not really sort of debated uh, or discussed this with other stakeholders like, like you know, businesses, consumers, etc. So, do you think that, that that needs to have a far greater, uh, that piece of dr the draft uh, legislation will need to be discussed far more with stakeholders? No, the fact that they put it out into public domain is intended for that, I okay. suppose, yes. So, I am sure it will happen. I think uh, there has been a fairly healthy exchange at least between government and organized so far on yeah, GST. Yeah, yeah. On GST. So, I do not see any reason why there should be any apprehension that there will not be uh, open discussion on this. And this you you and you you are hopeful that this could be one big reform which certainly I mean will push to growth over the next uh, four five no years. There is no doubt about that. Thank you very much uh, Mr. Harshwadam Nyutia for talking to us. Thank you. That is all we have in this uh, edition of State of the Economy. We will be back with you next week. Thanks for watching.